All right, as we do here at Hope for Prisoners, we give honor to whom honor is due. I want to introduce a, a, a gentleman that will be our guest speaker tonight. This, this guy has a heart as big as the city of Las Vegas. You, oh, yeah. oh, somebody's all in. I hear you. Are you all in, huh? This, this, this gentleman is a great friend, a great lover of people, a great lover of humanity. Please give it up for Daniel on the ground. Oh. Okay. <laughs> now we, huh? Oh, we got a microphone? Yeah, we mic you up, man. Look at that. I got a loud voice. I could yell. <laughs> all right. Hello, everybody. Hello. For those of you that have no idea who I am, I'll give you a little background. Uh, I'm a poker player, professional poker player in my career. For most of my career, I, I've been the all-time money leader with over 40 million in earnings. So I didn't start that way though, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, and I've been playing the game for 20 years. I come from Toronto, Canada. If you've watched ESPN in the old days and you know NBC, you've probably seen, if you watch poker at all, you definitely would have seen me on one of these shows because uh, I won a lot. <laughs> but uh, as I said, you know, it didn't all, it didn't start that way, right? Like, so, you know, Rodney asked me to come out here tonight and kind of share with you a little bit about how I got from where I was to where I ended up, which is having the dream life that I always wanted, right? And I was a very confident kid. My, my parents probably would say too confident. My mom got me this letter. I, she got it for my birthday. It was 10 years old. Uh, September 10th, 1984, and it said something to the effect of, it was from the principal, and it said, we will not tolerate Daniel's poor manners and behavior, and he will be expelled from school. And your own insistence to always excuse Daniel from everything he does will not be tolerated. And I, you know, I appreciated that because I had the love and support from my parents. So from that confidence, even as a very young, I always remembered thinking and believing that I was gonna be something. I thought maybe I'd be an actor or I'd be somebody special. And I think part of the reason I was able to have success in my life is because it started with belief, right? Like, if you don't believe, if you don't actually believe you can do something, you'll never be able to do it, right? For example, let's say, okay, the question is, can I jump 100 feet up in the air, right? Well, I'm gonna think about that, first of all, and I'm like, I don't believe I can do it. I know I can't do it, so how much work would I actually put into doing it? None, because what's the point? I'm not gonna be able to do that. Um, so whenever I goal set, which I, which I wanna to get to in a minute, because goal setting has always been a big part of my life, I try to think of goals in such a way that it's juicy, it scares me a little bit, but it's within grasp. It's not fantasy land. It's not me jumping 100 you know, feet up in the air. It's something that I can see it, I can taste it. I know that if I put the hard work in, I can accomplish it, right? So this starts with the belief. Like if you actually believe you can do something, well, what's next? It doesn't just happen. You know, I know a lot of millennials want it to, but it doesn't work that way. <laughs> like, you actually have to put in the hard work. Um, and so in my life, I, uh, I failed a lot, okay? And when I failed, there was a lot of opportunities, I was relatively young in my early 20s, to quit and just give up because people were better than me. So in Toronto, I was like a bull in a china shop. You know, I was the, the big fish in a small pond and I was able to win pretty consistently in Toronto. I came to Las Vegas, you know, 21 years old, like, I got this, watch me now, watch me now. I sat down with these guys in Vegas, um, I brought $3,000 with me, and 24 hours later, I had a lot of free time on my hands, because <laughs> money was gone. So I had a, chan a, lot of a lot of opportunities to reflect. When I first, um, and what I would do is I'd go back home to Toronto, tail between my legs, um, trying to figure this out. And then um, I, I would keep coming back to Vegas. I always had a belief that if I continue to learn and, and be better, that I can beat these guys. And I, it didn't work out for the first year, I would say. It was a lot of lonely walks because I didn't have enough money for cab fare, really, from Mirage to Paradise and Twain, the budget suites there. That's where I was staying because it was the cheapest place. And I'm glad, actually, in some ways, I didn't have cab fare because those walks were probably the most important in shaping my career. Because like I said before, during those walks, I had the opportunity to you know, decide, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do tomorrow? You know, I got no money, am I gonna go back home? Um, I, I, you know, or, or am I gonna you know, try to make this work? And so it was a real sort of like opportunity to self-reflect and dig deep. And I remember every morning I'd wake up with like a plan. 
Like we're gonna get back in this game. And I'd made a name for myself among friends, so when I'd go broke, I could get a stake, they would loan me some money, work my butt off to, uh, you know, to try to make it right, which you know, I eventually did through a lot of hard work. But uh, well, I talked a little bit earlier about goal setting, and I guess I wanted to share with you a little bit about how I tackle it, right? Because I think we all have goals, right? And goal is to not just be where I'm at. My goal is to improve, and I, I, it drives me in everything that I do, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, whether it's relationship. Um, I feel like life is juicier and better when you have goals. And I also find that when you set goals, it, uh, it, it's more, you, you, you open yourself up to bigger possibilities. So I'll tell a little story about these two women, right? Okay, so January 1st, Mary and Jane, I'm, forgive the names, yeah, right? So Mary and Jane both decide, they're like, January 1st, we're gonna lose some weight, right? They're both relatively overweight, right? So Mary says, I'm gonna lose, you know, I'm gonna lose five pounds in the next two months. Jane says, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds in the next two months, right? Fast forward two months, Mary lost exactly five pounds, okay? She did it. Now, Jane, she set a goal of 20. She didn't hit it. She only lost 17, okay? So the question is, who succeeded and who failed in this? Who do you think succeeded and failed? They both did. They both did, that's the answer. But notice one thing, right? While they both did, the person that set the goal, that little itty bitty goal of five, well they achieved that, which was too easy in a sense, and the other person who strived to get to 20 lost a lot more because they set their goals a little bit higher, right? So um, first of all, I mean, when I set goals, I think of like what is the goal, right? So for Mary and Jane, the goal was to you know, lose some weight, right? And then the next question I ask myself is how? Okay, so you gotta have a plan, right? So the, you know, whether it's you know, diet, exercise, this types of things. Um, I also think it's important too to have what's called like a buy when, right? So if I'm gonna set a goal, whether it's a three month goal, two month goal, a year long goal, I wanna, I wanna have a benchmark, right? So I know where I'm going. Like okay, so the weight is an easy example, right? So if I say I'm gonna lose 10 pounds in a month, what's that, two and a half a week? Okay, so if after two weeks I've only lost two, right? Well now I know I gotta make some adjustments and then you know you course correct and things like that. But if you don't have sort of a timeline, it's very easy to get complacent and the things, when things get hard, you're like, meh, ah, it's too hard, I'm just gonna quit. I'm gonna have a drink, I'm gonna eat a pie, a couple pizzas, <laughs> which we got a lot of back there, it looks like. <laughs> um, the other thing is like who, okay, which, which is a weird part of the equation. And the who comes from, like, who do I gotta be? Right, like what do I gotta sacrifice? What do I gotta be better at? What do I gotta take a risk on? So, you know, if it's, let's say for example, and this ain't me, but if you, I wanna be a stand-up comic, right? Well, who do I gotta be? I gotta be confident, right? I gotta be driven, I gotta be motivated, I gotta be willing to deal with rejection because when people don't laugh at your jokes, that hurts. So what do you do when it hurts? Quit or try to tell a better joke, right? And the most important like, part of the equation whenever it comes to goal setting for me ultimately is why, right? So, oh, I wanna lose weight, but for what? What's the point? What are you doing this for? If you don't have a real clear why as to what, you, you're going through the motions every day, if you don't know why you're doing it, it's so much easier to just quit. Like, what's the point, right? Well, who cares? If your why is this, okay, I can't play with my kid because I'm too tired. I, you know, I don't have an energy. I'm, I'm, oh, I wanna be a better example for my kid or something along those lines. Now, when, when you're struggling and you're looking at a big piece of pie and you think to yourself, okay, well, why wouldn't I eat this? Well, because I have a bigger goal and I have something that matters to me, right? So I've always been a big believer in goal setting throughout my life. It's something I've always strived at uh, incorporating and it's been a recipe for me for like success in my life. And I'm not saying that you, you all need to do it the way that I do it. I'm just sharing what's worked for me and if you glean anything out of that that's of value to you, awesome, right? Um, so in addition to goal setting, then like I asked myself, and this was probably around 2004, where I was setting myself up to succeed, right? So let's say I would have a goal of going to, let's say Mississippi, and I'm gonna play a poker tournament. My goal is to win the poker tournament, right? That's my intention, that's my goal. Okay, well, when I was younger, I'd have these spots where I'd be like, okay, that's my goal. But then the night before, I'm out drinking at the bar till four in the morning. So then I asked myself, okay, were those actions 
actually in line with what I say my intention is? No, right? Because in order for me to be at my best, I need sleep. Drinking isn't, <laughs> isn't a good idea. So I want to be focused. So I started to think about it in a different perspective, which is what you call clear intention, right? So my intention is win the tournament. Now I got to work backwards and go, everything that I do, all the actions I take have to be in line with that. So cut out the drinking the night before. Also, start thinking about what do I want to look like when I'm at that final table. Make sure I bring a suit. Another thing I don't do is I don't set up myself for failure when you know, a lot of people say, well, we can go out tomorrow night if I bust the tournament. I don't put that out there into the universe. There is no bust out the tournament. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win this thing, and I want to make sure that I set myself up for that. If the tournament ends on Friday, I don't book a flight on Thursday to leave home. Because then I'm putting it, you know what I mean? A lot of people do that. A lot of players, they make that mistake, where a tournament starts on a Monday, and usually they're about five days, might end on a Friday. They book a flight for Wednesday. So I'm like, OK, well, you'll probably be on that plane. I don't want to be on that plane. I'll book mine for Saturday you know, to give myself I, I, every, every action I take. I don't want to put out the maybes, the what ifs, the failures. Obviously, I'm not always going to win the tournament. right? And sometimes I'll be available to go home on Wednesday. All right, I'll change my flight. But I'm not going to set myself up for failure right off the bat where uh, you know, I'm, I'm already putting out there like what I'm gonna do when it doesn't work out. Like there's a lot of, you know, we all have those conversations in our head about why we can't do something. And if we focus so hard on that, and I'm like, he knows me like this, I analyze everything. You know, that's what I do, and analyze people, analyze poker, all that kind of stuff. If you have a task, let's say you wanna do something, and you start to analyze it to the point of, it's, it's a, there's a term we use, it's called analysis is paralysis. Because the more you analyze something for the reasons you can't do it, <laughs> You'll, you'll prove yourself right. You know, you will find a way to like, see like, well, all the reasons why I can't work. Okay, I wanna start this business. Well, but I don't have the money. I don't know enough people. I'm not qualified enough. Uh, I, I don't think I'm smart enough. Okay, well you have all these reasons why you can't. And what happens for a lot of people, most of us in a lot of cases, don't even bother you know, start or trying. Whereas you know, taking the opposite approach of just taking the risk without knowing for, you know, for sure what the outcome is, opens you up like, to bigger possibilities. It's like self-doubt. It's very easy for us. We all you know, have stuff, right? We all got stuff. Um, when I first met him, I had my own stuff that I didn't even realize was a thing. I had a girl I loved, OK? I think she loved me, but she definitely loved a lot of other people, too. <laughs> that I knew of, right? And so, you know, she de yep. You know, we were, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, we were young. Well, she was a lot younger. Um, and I didn't realize, like, I thought I dealt with it because it was heartache for me. Like, I wanted to marry this woman. This was like, I don't know, 10 years ago. I really did. I wanted to marry this woman. <laughs> Crazy, right? And so uh, then I, you know, I went on with my life. I thought I dealt with it. And I realized now I hadn't because that hit my confidence across everything I do. It crushed me. I was like, I wasn't doing as great at poker. I was becoming more complacent with mediocrity. All these types of things. Like, and I was able to, actually thanks to this man too, we have good rapport with that, coaching me through it, you know, sort of getting my confidence back and having a chance to see that whole thing differently, right? Because back then, I blamed her for everything. She lied to me, she did this, she did this, she did this. And I remember telling that story to him like that, where it's like, she did, she did, she did, she did. And he's like, okay, well, how about you try to tell me that story from like, the responsible side. We're like, what did you do? Okay? And I'm like, well, she did say she wasn't really, didn't want to be exclusive. You know, she kind of made a mention that, you know, she has a drug problem at the time and that she's not really fit and that she breaks men and that she's really a bad catch at this time. So I, I, I failed to mention that all the first time. But then, so the second time, so the, the second time when I told the story, it was like, huh, yeah. I guess she wasn't so bad after all. So you know what I did? You know what I did? In May, I married her. <laughs> I did, yeah. Which is awesome. Uh, <laughs> right? She's, she's grown up, too. She's really grown up a lot. Um, but you know what's interesting, too, is I realized right back then, the man that I was, I couldn't have been with, even if we were together and all that stuff, it wouldn't have worked. Because I didn't have that confidence and that drive. I wasn't ready for something like that. I needed to change. I needed to be a bigger, better version of myself. And she did too. Like we both had our growing pains and you know, we came back together uh, 
re, you know, recent, like we, I, we just, she just came back to town, what was it, August? Married by May, you know, and we good, we good. Yeah, very happily married, just came back from honeymoon. So, uh, yeah, yeah, let's go. We're gonna have babies, we're gonna adopt, we're gonna do the whole thing. It's gonna, it's gonna be a blast, but, um, so yeah, um, that's a little bit of my story. I don't know if you, you want to do Q&A, kind of see if anyone has some questions. Absolutely. All right, does anyone have questions? Fire away, they can be poker, they can be anything you want. Yeah. Um, are you related to Simon Sinek? <laughs> I don't know who Simon Sinek is. Never mind. Okay. Never mind. Um, if you were getting out of prison for the first time in 20 years, what would you do? Ooh. Hmm, that's a great question. If I was getting out of prison for the first time in 20 years, and I've actually thought of that scenario. Um, I have, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not because I've done anything, but just, you know, anything's possible. Um, what would I do? So it's difficult, right? Like, I've learned a lot about the struggles that people go through, through prison, through Rodney. It, it, I don't think a lot of people know, like, unless you've been through the system, unless you've actually had to go through it and see how, I guess, messed up it can be sometimes and how unfair it feels and how wrong, like, I can only, you know, to answer your question, I can only go based on my own experiences, which are gonna be different than everybody else. I've always had an incredible amount of confidence that I could come back. Because of my history, when I first came out here and went broke, went back, went broke, went back, went broke, but always was able to find myself a way to rebuild. So what I would do it, for me is I would lean on my family and friends. Like really, like for me, I would think about poker and I know that I'm a professional poker player, so what, what I need is I'd need tools. Right? My tools are different than an electrician's tools. Mine are just money. <laughs> like, give me some money so I can play some poker. So I would go to friends or I'd go to family or I'd go to other players and stuff like that and I would, um, I would ask uh, for a loan. The next thing I would do is try to, within that you know, loan, I would try to uh, keep my expenses as low as possible. Because I think, well, in my industry, the biggest mistake a lot of people make is they spend more than they make. I have a friend, and this is big money, this is big numbers. He, you know, he's got two kids, and he was you know, not doing so great on money. He asked me to stake him. And when you stake somebody, that means you put up the money, they get half of the winnings, you get the other half of the winnings. So he asked me to stake him. And I was like, okay, well, you're not doing so hot. Well, tell me, you know, um, how, much you, how much do you need? And what, you know, how much, how, what is your monthly nut? Like, how much are you spending a month on your family? He said $25,000. I'm like, you're broke and you're spending $25,000? He's paying $10,000 for rent, $4,000 for a car, all this kind of stuff. So then I tried to break down the numbers with him. I go, buddy, so for you to break even every month, you got to make $50,000 because I'm going to get twenty five. dollars You're going to get twenty five. dollars That's assuming everything goes perfect. And I said, okay, how do you plan on making that much money? Well, I'm going to go play at the Bellagio. Okay, well, what, what, what's that game look like? What's the biggest winner in that game make? Okay. And I, and I said, okay, now how many hours a week would you have to play to make that kind of money? And we broke it down, and he'd have to play 130 hours in a week. <laughs> it's just not enough hours. So the, see, the problem with him was like, his plan was faulty. He's a good player. He could make money playing poker, absolutely. He's gonna make money in this you know, business of his. The problem is, it doesn't matter how much he makes. He can't make enough to you know, cover his expenses. So how, do, how does he deal with that, and how would I advise is like, lower the expenses way down. I said, if you can get down to where you're spending 7,500 or 8,000, oh, now there's some hope. But he was buried right off the bat because he had a bad plan. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Yeah, you, and you stress the importance of knowing the why behind your goals or our goals. What are some of your whys? Um, well, yeah, that's a good, well, that's great, man. That's a good, really good question. I'm supposed to know the answer to that. Yeah, um, well, my why was, it started out because I really love poker. And for me, I wanted to be the best, and I wanted to make a lot of money doing it because I wanted to live my dream life, right? And I knew for me, in order to have that dream life, I needed to have, you know, the resources to have it, which was... To, you know, I worked really hard in my 20s and 30s so that I could live a life of leisure if I choose to. If I want to go golfing, I can. If I want to relax, I can. So my why was really, I guess, ultimately like freedom and freedom, like financial freedom. Freedom for me to not have a boss, right? Not have someone telling me when to clock in, when to clock out. Like that's the dream life that I envisioned at 17, 18. But I knew in order to have that with the profession that I chose, it's going to be a lot of hard work. 
But the hard work was easier when I had a why, like an ultimate goal, right? So I hope that answers yeah. your question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I know in the beginning you played a lot. You probably had to grind it out, and probably in a lot of games. So how often are you playing these days? And I also heard something too that someone said the Daniel Negron doesn't play cash games anymore, strictly tournaments. I mean, are you playing pretty often still? Are you still got yeah. that passion? Well, as I said, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do was set up a life where now I've, you know, I'm married. We're looking to have children. We're looking to, you know, ch change the direction of my life, which also means scaling back on a lot of, like, you know, the work. But it's, it was all part of the bigger picture plan. Um, I, uh, like I said, I used to play a lot of everything, cash tournaments. That was what I was doing. It was I, I devoted my life to it. Like that's all I did. When I'd come to Vegas, wake up at Budget Suites in the morning, go to the casino. I didn't even take a lunch break. I went to go get a croissant and a yogurt, like on the. At the, at the little stand there, and I just played, and I worked, and I worked, and I studied, and all those types of things. I did that so that now I don't have to. Like, I still have a drive for it, but I noticed that if I don't feel like playing, and I don't want to play, and I don't have the drive, I'm not going to be as successful either. Like, if I don't have a passion for it, then I'm not going to succeed. This year, I've had a, quite a good year. There's a thing called the World Series of Poker. Um, there's a Player of the Year race, which I'm going to be going to Czech Republic at, next month. Try to win. I'm currently in third place, but we'll be first by the end of it because, you know, there's no. One of the things I wanted to share too was a story with Rodney because Rodney coached me a lot in a lot of different ways. And one of the things we did was I tried to come up with a plan to get back on top because around that period with my now wife, there was time where, um, you know, I was okay. I was like among the best. I wasn't the best. So I went to Rodney and I said, you know what? I want to get back in the top 15 in the global poker rankings. That's what I want to do, top 15. He came at me with 15. <laughs> we don't do 15 around here. It's like, I'm not doing 15. So he challenged me to set the goal at number one. Well, I didn't like that because it's hard, it's scary. I don't know if I can do it. All these young kids are better than me. Like, I don't know if that I have the chops to succeed at that. But uh, I took it on anyways. And then three months, within three months, I'd won three events in a row, like $4.5 million, and I was number one for like a year. And part of that was you know, because he challenged me. He challenged me to push past my self-limiting beliefs about what I can accomplish and really just throw it out there. And that's scary, right? Like, but if it ain't scary, it's probably not worth it, right? Right. Yeah. So you have a lot of skills that you've built to play the game that you do. Did you do research outside of the game to like, understand people's psychology or uh, anything like that to try and make your game better? Yeah, no question. Like Poker, in a lot of ways, mirrors life. Because you know? you're dealing with people, you're dealing with math, you're dealing with yourself, you're dealing with your own you know, self-discipline, things like that. So studying mannerisms, studying people. I think whatever it is you guys do, and if it's not poker, it's something else, Like the more you understand about the industry that you're involved in, the, the, better are, like, the better off you are in terms of like, being successful. So I wanted to know everything. And uh, a lot of the work that I did was, for me, was studying people, because now there's videotape, right? You can watch on YouTube poker, you can watch anywhere. So I would spend, like I would take one player, let's say it's him, right? I'm playing poker with this guy, and I watch him on tape. I'll watch like seven hours of what he's doing, and I'll, and I'll do statistics, I'll keep track. Okay, every time he extended his elbow fully, like this, he had a bad hand. When he did this, 40% of the time, he had a good hand. He, he covered his mouth. That usually means he didn't have anything. So I just did field research like you would in any other kind of you know, job. And uh, in addition to that, not just like, I don't think today you can be successful at poker if you just play poker. You have to be mentally stable to deal with the ups and downs. The one thing that's unique about this job is you don't get a paycheck. Like I don't get a paycheck every week at the end of the week like, oh, boom. So some months, things don't go well. And the question is, is it me? Am I not playing well? Is it bad luck? And that's one of the most difficult things for most people, I think, in poker and in life, again, to like wonder, is it, am I not doing the right things, or am I being unlucky? What can I do to improve? I can't control the luck, right? I can't. I mean, I wish I could. All I can focus on is, OK, did I do everything that I was supposed to do? Is there anything I can work on to be better at? And everything available to me, including whether it was meditation, whether it was getting physically fit. Because if you look at poker players like 30 years ago to today, 
30 years ago, Dole Brunson's sitting there. You know, he's a big boy. And, you know, they're smoking and drinking and all that kind of stuff. And you look at the younger generation of poker player, and they look like athletes, you know. It's crazy because they understand the connection between the physical and the mental, right? And it has a huge effect on my, your ability to focus and concentrate and be your best. And it also makes you feel better, I think. So, yeah. All right. Question. When you set your goals, what do you, the value of the success or the value of the lessons, to, what do you treasure most? That's a great question. So the question he said is like, when I set goals, do I value the, you know, the, the, what, I, what I achieve or the journey, if you will? For me, it's all about the journey. The journey is where all the juice is. I love striving to do it. I set a goal every year, which people laugh at. It's I set a goal to win three World Series of Poker bracelets in one year. I've never done it before. And I set the damn goal every year. I've done two. I've done two. And I set that goal each and every year. Um, and what I do is, at the end of the journey, so when the World Series of Poker is over, okay, I haven't accomplished the goal. But the way I judge it as being a success or a failure is, did I do all the things I said I was going to do? Right? So if my plan was, all right, I'm going to show up on time, I'm going to get eight hours of sleep, I'm going to eat really good, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to do all these things, right? If I did all those things and I you know, didn't quite get there, that's okay. You know, I feel good about it. I, feel, I actually genuinely feel good about it. And I ask myself, all right, for next year, what can I do to set myself up even better, right? So as long as I follow my plan and I you know, came through with it, I, I, I'm in an industry where luck does play a role. Sometimes I can do everything right, still lose. But you just have to take faith, have faith in the fact that if I continue to do things right and I continue down the right path of making good choices consistently, eventually, you know, that's going to pan out and work out for me, right? It, it, I feel less, I feel more failure if I know that I didn't give myself the best chance. Like if I'm going to go to Europe, well, there's a different time zone, right? So jet lag's a thing. Well, if I don't prepare myself for that, I don't think ahead to it, then I kick myself in the, you know, in the, in the butt because I'm like, well, you're exhausted. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon over there and you want to go to bed. <laughs> you know, and you've got eight or more hours to play. So for me, it's always about the journey and knowing that, like, that I guess it's the word integrity is where I, come, where, where I go with it, right? If I say I'm going to do something to myself, I want to hold my word to myself. And sometimes I'm going to fail, you know, such is life. When you got to get back on the hobby horse and just get like, okay, you don't want to beat myself up too much, just acknowledge it, go, okay, so we screwed that up. All right, what do we do now? We've got to have a new plan, new direction. Let's, you know, let's get, let's back on, get back on track. All right, over here. What's, what, what's, your, what's your favorite hand to play? My favorite hand to play. It's a bad one. It's a 10-7. Oh, okay. I don't recommend it. So don't blame me if you lose with that hand. It's not very good. <laughs> Yeah. How with your goals, do you write them daily? Do you post them and look at them? How do you go about that? So with my goals, one of the things I've done for years, which I don't know if it's controversial, but it's something that I, I that helps me for accountability is, I write it on the internet and I post it to the world. Like I write at the, in January first, I write a blog that I post with like ten specific goals, and then I typically don't really like, and I write them out in great detail, and I typically don't really look at them a lot throughout the year, because I don't want to be attached necessarily to the results. At the end of the year, I look back on the year that I had and sort of go over. Usually I'll set 10. You know, if I hit five, that's a really good year. No, really, because I'm, I'm not setting little itty bitty baby goals. I'm setting goals that are like, huh, crazy. And you know, a lot of people criticize in, in the community because poker players are very logical thinkers. They're very anal in a lot of ways. And they say, well, how can you set a goal on something that you can't control? Because it's not, it doesn't work that way, really, for me. Like, I want, I want to win three bracelets, so why not put it out in the universe, right? I know that I'm not always going to succeed, but I'm going to do everything I can to do so. And I, the key is, I don't feel like a failure if I don't get there. Like, if I only won one bracelet or two bracelets, I'm not going to look and look and go, dang it, I should have had three, you know? Um, so, yeah, I take a lot of pride in, uh, in you know, like I said, in the journey and just... Uh, being a man of my word to myself, which is more important than to anyone else, right? Yeah. Tell me why you 
go public with your goals? What, what are you trying to achieve? Right, so when I go public with my goals, it's, it's a little bit about accountability too, right? And also part of it is like, part of what I realized, you know, a person asked me a question earlier about my why in life. Part of it is like inspiration. Like I like to inspire people. It's fun for me. Like that's part of what I, I see value in, whatever, whether it's my story, ability to connect with people. But sharing it with other people is kind of sharing like, well, this you could try this, right? I don't claim to have all the answers because I know that I don't. All I can do is share my method, what's worked for me. And again, as I said, if there's stuff in there that sounds like it might work for you, you want to try it on, why not? I think the biggest mistake people make in life a lot of times is, is a fear of trying something new or trying a new direction. Yoga, ah, I'm not doing no yoga. <laughs> Yoga's, yeah. Then you go to yoga and you're like, wow, my back feels better, right? right. <laughs> Just a lot of people have these preconceived ideas and we're, we're afraid of risk. We're, we're afraid of trying on something new. So I go public with it to be a stand, really, for it. Thanks for your answer. I, I own several real estate companies, companies in Sacramento. At the beginning of every year, I had all my agents in a goal meeting where we shared our goals to everybody. And I, I've been accused of doing this the wrong way, but it worked like gangbusters. And I'm so happy that you go public with it. Mainly it was accountability. If you're sitting next to Jane, and Jane had a goal to close three houses or 10 houses a month, and you're sitting there with one, and you know that, it's going to drive you a little harder than, than if you didn't know that about her. Yeah. For sure, I think it's dependent upon a person, right? Like some of you may not want to go public and, and share your goals because for a lot of people, you know, let's say for example, this quitting smoking. Uh, my mother, she was a chain smoker. She smoked two and a half packs a day, like, you know, three, three packs even or whatever. And uh, she had tried to quit several times, but she told everybody, you know, and then when she failed, she felt like a failure. She felt like, oh, they're gonna give me crap about it and whatever. So she finally quit, because again, I said everyone's different. She finally quit when she didn't tell anybody. My dad smoked occasionally, and then you know when she'd see him smoke, she'd leave the room. And after about a week or two, he's like, you know what? You haven't been smoking. She's like, I quit. <laughs> Just like that. So I think it's important to try this stuff on and make it work for you, right? You don't, this, my plan is my plan for me. This is what works for me. You figure out what, you know, what works for you. And for some people, you know, sharing that, uh, sort of thing is you know potentially detrimental. So there's no one size fits all plan. But I, I'd say that having a plan, like, is a good step, whatever that plan may be. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Questions? So, right here. I've watched you for many many years on TV. Uh, I don't play poker, but just between you and me, what's your biggest tell? <laughs> he basically just told me to give him my trade secret. I'll tell you what my biggest tell is. So here's what you don't know and most people don't know about me. I, was, I have Tourette's. You know what Tourette's is? So Tourette's could be verbal, it could be you know, twitches. Mine are with my eyes and I blink. So I can blink uncontrollably sometimes. Well, I remember being on a show called High Stakes Poker and I was in this big pot, I had 50,000 in cash and I threw it in the middle. Right? And I was bluffing, I didn't have it. And my eyes were going like this, right? So everybody's watching this, and I know they're watching the video, so what do they think? They think, well, when he's bluffing, he blinks a lot, like that. I'm like, actually, it's just my Tourette's. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but I learned, you know what I did was I took advantage of that. So the next time when I was playing with people that I knew would watch that show, and I had it, I had like four aces, and I wanted to go, I started going like, <laughs> like, like, he's twitchy, like all kinds of crazy. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, yeah, they, they, you know, it worked for a while, and then they got, they're like, hey, wait a minute. That blink doesn't even what I thought it did. <laughs> Anybody else? Questions? Right there. I got a couple. Okay. One, okay, I was always curious about this, but so say you're in the World Series, I know you made the final table like a, little, a few years back, um, and you get a big score like that. How much does the IRS take out of that? Too much. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't even know, but I think it's, well, with the way they, with, when you're a professional gambler, you file as a professional gambler. So at the end of the year, you know, you, you take your, your payouts minus your buy-ins, and I don't know, what is it, like 30, I don't even know what we pay in tax. It was like 30%? Something like, oh, millions, yeah. For professional, they take out more. Um, no, actually, they don't take it out, unless you're from another country. Like if you're from Canada. File. 
Yeah, so you file at the end of the year or anything that you win. Are you ready to play the World Series of Poker? It's only been a dream of mine. Okay. I've been watching you. I'm actually a huge fan. I appreciate right. it. Another thing. Yeah. You said you had like over 40 million. I know you're the all-time money winner. So you have a lot of investments outside of poker, right? Like, I mean, you got to have like real estate, a lot of things going on. Yeah, one of the things when I was young, my focus was poker. That's it. I didn't know anything else. I came out here, I wasted so much money. Like I rented a car paying like way too much. I was, I, I just didn't have, I didn't have a real good understanding of money and how the world works and how to like get a plan. Um, and then, but then I realized how important all that stuff is. Like I finally got a guy, like a financial consultant, put money in different investments and things like that to prepare myself. But I was so devoted to poker that everything else kind of took a back seat. And I, that's not like, I don't subscribe, I don't think that's, that's a viewer discretion is advised type mentality. That's not a good way to live. Like it's much more important to, um, you know, have like financial planning and being responsible. I definitely wasn't, but luckily I learned a lot from it, you know, and I was able to correct it. You know, questions? Oh, what's that? Oh, never mind. Go ahead. I just I wonder if you saw the comedian on AGT that has Tourette's and how he used it to his. So I met him. Did you? Really I met him because I went to the AGT. She's talking about America's Got Talent. There was a comedian who has Tourette's, and uh, I went to go see the show, and I was sitting in the front row. Nice. And uh, after the show, he came up and he was like, "You have Tourette's, don't you?" I was like, how did you know? Because I thought I had it all, you know, whatever. Because he can, you know, when you have it, you can just like tell when people do these little blinks and stuff like that, and then it triggers it. But yeah, no, I mean, it's never been something that, it's kind of crazy to think that a poker player who's supposed to have a poker face has Tourette's. Like, that doesn't make no sense. <laughs> but because I'm a- I guess, just so you know that until you brought it up, and then you totally reminded me of him, and that's what- <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. You were doing your little, yeah. I, I saw him. So yeah, that's, He's, that's we got the finals on tonight. Yeah. Yeah. What is global, what is the global website? The Global Poker Index? So she was asking before I had set a goal with Rodney where I want to be top 15 on the Global Poker Index. Um, and we ended up getting number one. What that is, is it's like the rankings, okay? So it's like, you know, in tennis, they say, okay, Serena Williams, she's number one. She's number four. So that's the rankings. And it's, they have a poker ranking too, which uh, they, you know, they judge you based on how you do in the tournaments and stuff. Okay. Anybody else? Questions? Here we go. Did your parents play cards or how did you get it? My, mom, no, my parents did not play cards. My mom, when I was a teenager, this was funny. I told my mom, Mom, I want to be a professional poker player. She says, Daniel, forget about poker. You go to school. Right? And I was like, she didn't get it. She did not get it. So then I was like, I took it very seriously and I showed her my books. And then I bought her a car, and I bought her a house, and she's like, poker, poker's okay. <laughs> I like poker. <laughs> she turned, her tune changed pretty fast, yeah. How long did you play until you started making like, really good money? So how long did I play before I started making really good money? I started pretty young. I started when I was like 17 or 18 years old. And I was living at home, so that was you know, easy. I would say it took probably about five years six years before I made good money off? Well, it depends on the definition of good money. But I would say about five years of hard work. Because I think, you know, I don't know if you've read that book by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers. 10,000 hours. There you go, she knows what's up. So the theory behind this, it's in this book, is yes. that in order to master something, you need to put in 10,000 hours of time into that thing to really feel like you have a grasp. So that's about what five years, four years worked out to for me. Yeah. Do you have a favorite author? Favorite author? Um, well, I just mentioned Malcolm Gladwell. He's right up there. I also like a guy named Stephen Covey, who wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Really good one there. And then uh, I've read some of the Eckhart Tolle stuff. That's a hard read, because it's very confusing. But it's interesting. You know, I like, I like to read stuff sometimes that challenges me. That stuff does. I recommend Simon Sinek's uh, Start With Why. Start With Why, Simon Sinek. OK, we'll add that to the list. So reference the 2,000 hours, the 10,000 hours, how many hours condensed would you think that you practiced a week from the time you were 17? Say 40, 50, 80? What was your average? Yeah, so when I played, well, that's, that's what part of practice is, is actually you know, experiencing the playing part. But I also felt like it was, it was equally important. So let's say there was a 10-hour day. 
I would spend seven or eight of that playing and two to three hours of that studying. So part of what studying was for me was note taking, right? And I think this applies to not just poker, but like whenever you do something, sort of journaling or having like a, an idea of, okay, what, what, what went right, what went wrong? What, what do I need to address? What do I need to fix? And with me, a lot of the time it was poker hands. So if I was in an interesting spot, wasn't sure what to do, I'd be like, okay, let me write down the details of it, go home to my computer, because now you can solve stuff on computers, and I would do simulations and try to really break down the situation so that the next time I faced that same obstacle, I was better prepared, right? So with poker, let's say you start, or poker than pretty much anything, let's say you start like with a new thing. You don't know anything about it, okay? Well, you learn one thing. So you, you make a mistake. Okay, you learn something from that mistake. All right, well that's a mistake hopefully that you got down now. So next time you're gonna get it right. With poker, there's so many different variables and different mistakes you can make that you just try to lessen the number of them, right? So you just continue to try to grow on that. Like a golfer, like every golfer who golfs, they almost never hit a perfect shot because a perfect shot goes in a hole, right? They're just trying to make their misses smaller. Yeah. How does the analysis paralysis play into that? Well, with practice. When I talked about, when I use the term analysis is paralysis, that's more so for um, you know, getting started on doing something, like taking a risk. Um, analysis in poker is a must, right? But part of what analyzing all the time does is it sets your brain up to do that, right? So you guys are familiar with Bobby Fischer, the chess player? So Bobby Fischer, he kind of like, uh, I guess he lost his mind a little bit. Well, a lot. <laughs> and, uh, and part of the reason is, like, chess is a great game, it's beautiful, but what you do when you play chess is that you're constantly in a state of paranoia. If I do this, he might do this, he might do this, he might do this. So it's constantly training your brain, and he's spending 10, 12 hours a day doing that on the game. But that also had an effect on his life. He started to feel like, oh, there's something in the stop sign that's, like, getting in my head, and there's something, you know, he had, he started to have, like, paranoia in his real life. So whatever we practice, whether it's in, 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 what, in whatever you know, endeavor, that's, that's going to be part of like, you know, it's going to have an effect on you outside of just what you're doing as well, both good or bad, depending. I got another one. Okay. So a lot of this I know, um, ex offenders here within the whole program, we have set goals and achieved them, and then some of us maybe, you know, lost focus and then maybe lost connections and fell off. So my question to you is you said once you got number one, do you remember like that moment when you found out you were number one and what did you do to prevent any let up or what goals did you have after you had reached number one? Yeah, so that's the interesting question too. So one of the reasons that goal setting remains a part of my life, uh, and I think it's important for me, and again, this is not true for everyone, is once I've achieved a goal, I can't stay stuck. I need to set another one or I need to have a new direction. I need to figure out something else, whether it's in poker or whether it's in something else. I, oh, I constantly wanting to be, learn to be a better version of myself every day in whatever it is, right? So if I'm stuck, like you said, I got to number one, now what? That happened to me in the year 2000. In 1999, I killed it. I won everything, I was on top of the world. You know, I was single, I was here in Las Vegas. I uh, didn't have family here. I didn't have a lot of a foundation. And I didn't have a goal at that time. So what I do is I was, you know, living the life, you know, drinking, you know, playing poker, playing golf, not really focused on anything. Well, it didn't take but a year for all that, you know, progress I made in 99, all that money, gone. One of the best things that ever happened to me, really, because that year of like realizing, like, man, if I don't have a foundation, I don't have a core, I don't have any sort of reason. To do, to do this, then I'll just you know, mess up. And I saw too many guys make that same mistake where they build, they build, they work because they had something to work for. They worked and they get this money, right? Now they got the money and it's like, what next? They didn't have a what next. So what happens is, subconsciously they sabotage themselves, lose all the money, all of it. Because you know what? Now they have a goal again. Now they have something that they can wake up every morning and go, I gotta go get make money. But too many of the people I knew, once they got there, they got to the destination, they really didn't have like a what next. And that's super important, just to continue to, you know, strive to find other ways to, you know, better yourself. Yeah. So, in between tournaments, you study, analyze, practice, whatnot. 
what type of percentage do you structure for not poker related events? Yeah, so I don't play nearly as much as I used to. And when you're young, you're trying to absorb as much information as you can and learn and all these types of things. At, at my stage now, my advantage over the younger generation is my mental game. Wisdom, you know, wisdom and patience, which comes with age. You know, a lot of young poker players, they're coming in flailing, right? I know how to dodge the bullets. Like, you know, kind of be, oh, what bother and leave. So I spend less time on the fundamental, you know, like of the game, because I've got most of that pretty much down. I still do refreshers and try to like keep fresh, but mostly I make sure that before I play, I'm mentally ready to give my best. Like I don't play when I don't feel like I have that. Like I make sure that, um, you know, I also separate my schedule now, because like I said, I've achieved what I wanted to achieve in poker. I have, for the most part, right? So what do I want now is a little bit more balance. You know, I'm just newly married, as I mentioned. We're talking about children. So that's going to be a totally different, you know, not necessarily goal, but yeah, kind of a goal of making that work for us. Um, so, you know, because I've succeeded in, in that one area, I'm not done. You know, I have other things in my life that I want to do. If poker wasn't an option for you anymore, what would you be doing? Okay, if poker wasn't an option for me anymore, what would I be doing? So I would answer that two ways. If it was like poker was never an option for me, I would have liked to have been in acting or directing or writing or stuff like that, because I like that kind of stuff. Um, today, what would I do? Well, huh? What's that? Acting, I could do a little bit of that, some writing, stuff like that. But if I wasn't gonna play poker anymore, one of the things I'd probably do is this. A lot more of this, which is, I got, you know, I get um, asked now to go speak at events like I'm going on October 8th to San Francisco to speak to some you know you know tech people, try to inspire and things like that. So I enjoy that. It makes me feel like a life worth living. Um, uh, so financially, that you know that pays pretty good too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, if it wasn't for poker, um, probably writing and maybe I don't know, write a book or something like that. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, maybe I'll do. I, yeah, I've done poker books, but I want to do other stuff. Yeah, stuff that's more interesting. Yeah, exactly. Anybody else? All right. Rodney? <laughs> <laughs> <Good man. laughs>